Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Glad to Be Human show. I want to tell you I'm so excited for my guest today, uh, Victoria Riskin, a remarkable woman. I can't wait for you to hear more about her and about her work. But before we do that, I'm going to start with my theme song, as I so often do here. And welcome, Vicki. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to have a little ding dong. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Me down. I, um, um, I am going to first uh, introduce our people to to your your work a little bit. Uh, I have like an extremely wonderful bio for you. Uh, let me read this. Victoria Riskin is the author of Fay Ray and Robert Riskin, a Hollywood memoir, the highly praised dual biography of her parents published by Random House last year. If there were an Academy Award for movie books, Victoria Riskin would be making room beside the Oscar her father won for writing the romantic comedy classic, It Happened One Night. Part biography, part Hollywood history, part love story, Riskin's memoir about her parents is captivating and poignant. And that was Douglas Daniel from the Associated Press. Riskin enjoyed a long career as a psychologist before becoming an award-winning writer-producer for television. Vicky's credits inc include The Last Best Year, The Member of the Wedding, My Ant Antonia, I always want to say Antonia, and I know that's not right, My Antonia, uh, A Town Torn Apart, and World War II, When Lions Roared, for which she was named Television Producer of the Year by the Producers Guild of America. She's also a former president of the Writers Guild of America West, 2004, the union representing nearly 20,000 television and screenwriters. And in our household, we're extremely grateful for that. <laughs> Her numerous honors include the Writers Guild 2009 Valentine Davies Award for bringing honor to writers everywhere, the 2012 Woman of the Year from Santa Barbara, selected by Assemblyman Doss Williams, and a Woman of the Year selected by Senator Hannah Beth Jackson in 2014. She served on the International Board of Human Rights Watch for 12 years and headed the Hellman Hammett Prize Committee for HRW, a fund of the Lillian Hellman Estate dedicated to aiding persecuted writers around the world. She's currently a board member of the NPR station KCRW. She lives on Martha's Vineyard with her husband of 40 years, Emmy-winning writer-producer David W. Rintels. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much, Irene. <laughs> it's so great to be with you in particular because I oh admire God. you so much. And oh, I, I, it, well, mutual admiration society. This is a woman who continually has amazed me for probably almost 40 years I've known you. It's a long um, time, a good yeah, friendship. Yeah, it is. And, and, and well, we'll talk in a minute about uh, some of your newer ventures, but I, I, I know there are so many re uh, viewers who are interested in hearing about your fantastic book. It is a, it's a beautiful, uh, it's exactly what the, the AP said. It's a, it's a memoir. It's a love story. It's an incredible uh, picture of not only the golden age of Hollywood, but sort of the sunsetting age of, mm -hmm. uh, of Hollywood. Uh, how did you begin to write this book, Vicki? You know, I sometimes books. I, I suppose you you think through and you say, what what am I going to write? But sometimes they evolve, and this was kind of an evolution. I had been writing and producing in Hollywood in television, and we moved to Santa Barbara, and I was withdrawing from Hollywood and just happy to have some time to myself. Mm -hmm. And I started writing down some memories that I had of growing up. And I put together one chapter and then another chapter, sort of they piled up these chapters. And um, they were not very well organized. They were like uh, vignettes almost, you know, uh, snapshots. But somewhere in the process, um, 
I gave my pages to someone, there was about 250 pages, and they said, you know, I'd love to know more about your parents and how they came to Hollywood and uh, what Hollywood was like in the 1930s and 40s and so on. In addition to your story, it was as if someone just gave me the key and I went through the door and I never turned back. It was exactly what I wanted to do. I really <laughs> wanted, and maybe that happens, Irene, as you get older. <laughs> Not that I'm older, of course, but no. <laughs> no, certainly not. But you want to put together what is the tapestry of your life? What is it really? Who are the people that you you, you came from? What's their background? What what's the cable that was laid? Uh, so it was uh, it was at the right time at a crossroads of my life, and I began to just dive in like in the deep end doing research and reading letters and books and screenplays and oh. memos and um well and, it's such uh, a, a rich yeah. word life that your parents uh created for all mm -hmm. of us and left <laughs> for you uh, I, you mentioned letters uh, mm -hmm. I, I want folks to know that that when you read this book you are reading a genuine love story uh it, mm -hmm. it, it's a very beautiful exchange uh, tell me about the letters between them between we're talking about between you know, Fay Ray I, and Robert Riskin these remarkable Hollywood presences well, and just to set the stage, as, I mean, I'm assuming everyone watching knows who they are, but let's just assume <laughs> maybe there's a couple of people who don't. Uh, so my mother, Faye Ray, was a, an actress all through the 1930s. Actually, her career went from the late 20s to the 1960s, a huge mm -hmm. swath. But uh, she's most famous for being in King Kong. Um, mm -hmm. And yet she made a hundred movies in which she starred. So, so there's a lot more story to tell. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and my father was a screenwriter uh, who was probably th the top of his profession uh, in the 1930s, having done uh, Mr. Deeds Goes to Town, You Can't Take It With You, It Happened One mm -hmm. Night, Lost Horizon, Meet John Doe, all of these great films from the 19th. 30s that he wrote. But they're, the heart of the story is their love story. And it took a while till they found each other. They lived a considerable life. They had other relationships. They had uh, robust careers, but there was always something missing for each of them. And because they were bright and romantic spirits themselves and spunky, they were looking for sort of the perfect other, but maybe in the wrong places, you might say. <laughs> not bad, but not easy either. And so when they finally found each other, Irene, uh, it was a very strong connection. And it happened right after Pearl Harbor. So I think the context of the war influenced uh, the intensity, the sense that everything was at risk Mm -hmm. that finding each other was special and golden, mm -hmm. that uh, they dove into the, their being together with an intensity and an intimacy, and they wrote to each other because my mother was in New York doing radio, and my father had an assignment in Hollywood, and they, he went to Hollywood um, to do his assignment mm -hmm and began to write to her and he wrote these extraordinary letters and she wrote back. So that was sort of the first phase of their letter writing that I was able to sit down and you know, read um, what transpired between them. And then he uh, had an assignment for the Office of War Information, making movies during the war for the overseas market for people who've been living under fascism to tell the story of America. And he, both of them were very dedicated to the war effort. They, to mm. win the war was everything. Mm. So he went overseas and the letter writing continued. So uh, plus the intensity of what it was like when they got together and then the war would get it, pull them apart again in his assignment. Mm. So uh, that was a wellspring of insight, of uh, reflection, but for many years I couldn't read the letters. They, I had them, 
they were tucked away and they were too, it was too emotional for me to read them. Oh. Well, I'm so happy that you took a deep breath and decided to open those boxes and and open our our understanding of how people who love one another can communicate. Uh, I, I think we can all be enriched by realizing what a much bigger vocabulary we have for for expressing our love uh, to one another. Um, you know, is there is there anything you want to tell us about? The challenges, I know there were little challenges that uh, people are going to want to know about. The uh, I think there was like an eight-hour day your mom had uh, doing recording for King Kong. Can you oh, let us know? Oh, being an actress. I don't want to just emphasize King <laughs> Kong, but, but I know there are some folks here who are interested in hearing a little bit about that. And I, you mentioned a few details in your book that made me go, wow. <laughs> well. In the olden days, as they say, of Hollywood, there was no union. There were no protections. People worked extremely hard, sometimes 24 hours uh, on, on a shoot. She didn't mind that. But when, when I detailed what she did, I, I, it, it occurred to me that it was, it was pretty exhausting and excessive. Of course, she was protected in some ways because... She was a star and she had a lovely dressing room. But for example, she worked on King Kong. One shoot uh, was 24 hours. And the creator of King Kong, a man named Marion C. Cooper, uh, who was an extraordinary character. Uh, I loved researching about him. He was really one of the great characters of the 20th century. He came home and told his wife, uh, he was a Southerner, he said, I worked Faye 24 hours. <laughs> I really gave it to her. We had a tough shoot. And his wife said, you ever do that again and I'm leaving you. <laughs> because she was an actress and she knew how hard that was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there was another occasion when they had her in the sound studio to do the screaming for King Kong. As you know, there was quite a bit of that. <laughs> <clears throat> maybe too much, but they had her in there for eight hours screaming, you know, and then <sighs> while she was making King Kong, she was making another movie on the same set at the same time. So <sighs> if they were setting up for King Kong on one part of the studio, on one part of the stage, <clears throat> she would in the afternoon run over and do the most dangerous game in the afternoon, sometimes on the same day. So, uh, and it, it she, she just changed, uh, she put on a wig, you know, and ran over to the other <laughs> set. And that was also extremely physical. Mm -hmm. uh, she was being chased through half the movie. Uh, <laughs> she was being chased throughout Hollywood, I so understand. So she's being too. chased in <laughs> all kinds of ways. So they worked really hard, but they also, I mean, I think I don't want to just make it seem like it was only drudgery. It was not at all that. She had a fabulous time. She loved it. She was thrilled to be in the motion picture industry. She felt it was a big family that took care of her, looked after her, particularly the below the line people, you know, the makeup and the, yeah. the people on the set, the camera folks, and they were all kind of, they, they loved her and they were mm -hmm. cheering for her. So mm. she was never one of those temperamental or difficult people, which you could be easily because so much was writing on everything you did. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I wanted to uh, just flip over to your dad for a moment, because one of the amazing things in, in this supremely mm -hmm. intelligent person's life and this man who wrote words that just sing forever in us, you know, if you've ever seen Jimmy Stewart, <laughs> Mr. Deeds, or if you've ever, mm -hmm. you know, well, you've you've probably seen most of these wonderful films, but he was a high school dropout. I I discovered. Oh yes, oh musical. yes. He he got through the sixth grade, <clears throat> and in those days, see, uh, this is the early nineteen twenties. You know, he uh, kids did if they got through the sixth grade, that's all that was really expected of them. Wow. So, uh, but he was a natural writer. He was a bright kid, little boy. He wanted mm -hmm. to go make money as soon as he could. His parents were Jewish immigrants from Belarus. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So he got a little job selling newspapers on a trolley car. On the, uh, and hit with his brother, you know, they'd go up and down the aisles and ask for, for you know, sell the newspapers. And they were funny and adorable. <laughs> and, uh, and then he got a job working in the garment business, which was very common. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> excuse me. A lot of Jewish kids, well, the garment business was dominated by, by Jewish entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who then became, some of them went directly from the garment business right into Hollywood. <laughs> A crazy idea, right? I How love it. Go from <laughs> making suits and ties to, to the movie business, but Nickelodeons had come on board and little movies had come on board and these guys mm -hmm. had extra money. Uh, and, um, so he was working for uh, some shirt ma manufacturers named Heidemann and Levy, and they had invested in these uh, uh, short comedies, movie comedies, silent movie comedies. And one day they showed them in the office and my dad was there and they said, what do you think? And he said, I think they stink. <laughs> and um, they said, what do you mean? And he said, you're never going to sell those. They're, nobody's going to buy them. They're just no good. So they tried to sell these movies and nobody would buy them. And they came, he was now maybe 16, 17. They said, well, if you think you could do a better job, we'll send you down to Florida. You take over making these movies. And he did for two years. He made, I think, almost 100 movies. You know, oh they made these little short 10 minute movies. And uh, so that kicked off his career in the wow. movie business. And he Talk did everything. He wrote the craft. stories. Yeah. He, he even, even starred in a couple of them or was an extra in some of them. Mm. And then the war, then uh, World War I came. And so everybody, the whole thing collapsed because uh, once they started conscripting everyone, mm. he, he quickly was smart enough to sign up and mm. join the Navy and get a desk job. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> I, I, there, there is so much in this book. Uh, you know, there's you, Cary Grant has a crush on your mom. Carol Lombard had a crush on your dad. You know, it's just, uh, and, and to watch how their relationship grew and how, well, I don't want to give anything away, uh, but I do want to tell people, go get this. As summer is coming up. It is like the perfect read. You, it just, it just, <laughs> grabs you and doesn't let you go. So it's Faye Ray, Robert Riskin, A Hollywood Memoir by Victoria Riskin. Now, why am I closing out that? Well, that's because we are, we've we been talking about the past, but one of the most incredible things about Vicki is what she has in her mind for the future. <laughs> and uh, I'll just say, these are the earrings that I'm wearing on your behalf. Oh, know, thank you. Please. Well, now that's a very interesting thing that you're wearing those <laughs> earrings. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, you've known me long enough to know that I, I'm driven by passion and my passions will go from one thing to another and it generally has worked out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, not when I was dating when I was a teenager, but other than that, <laughs> they worked out. My current concern, and I think it's a shared concern among everybody probably listening and you, is about climate change and about all the adjustments that we need to start making to tackle some of the issues that we're, we're facing. But I know how overwhelming it can be. <clears throat> didn't feel like it's rather daunting. So to address the issue, I'm starting uh, a magazine and it's called Blue Dot Living at Home on Earth. Blue Dot, are those earrings blue dots? <laughs> well, that's, yes. <laughs> what a curious yeah, thing. They look great. <laughs> and uh, we, our first issue comes out on Martha's Vineyard where I live uh, at the end of May, but we hope to take it around the country to different communities mm -hmm. uh, and find talented writers and maybe small media companies or help people get it off the ground. Because the issues that we face here where I live are different than the issues 
other people face where mm-hmm. they live. Mm-hmm. And so, and the spirit of the adventure is upbeat and it's humorous and it's to ease everybody's way into this conversation um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> so that they will start to feel like they can do a few things and we can all pitch in and make a difference together. So it's it's family building. I wanna build a family mm-hmm. around the country and uh, of these of these magazines and also uh, an engaging, fun, quizzy um, mobile application so people can cool. learn stuff and play and find good companies. That's the other thing. There are lots of good companies out there, Irene, Mm -hmm. making organic cotton, you know, instead of regular cotton clothing, Mm -hmm. uh, which saves tons of water because organic requires much less uh, water. I mean, there are many things that we could just do as consumers. We have the power in our Mm -hmm. hands. So let's drive it. I, I am so with you, and I love this idea. Uh, I know you compared it. There's a magazine around called Edible, mm-hmm. uh, which you know you can walk into a natural food store or pick it up. But I, I have we've discovered all kinds of really interesting artisanal producers of food, uh, restaurants we'd never heard of, other kinds of wonderful craft things in that. And I love this idea of there being a magazine that you can just go pick up and go, well, what's going on locally? Oh, maybe I can go hang out there or bring my this thing there or right. Or, or it's better uh, to throw away a incandescent or, bulb or yeah. do we wait till it burns out? You know, those kinds of <laughs> questions that we all have and don't quite know where to go. And right. it sounds like the app will be a place that we might be able to enter a, a, a question like that and get it answered, you know, like this. That's right. That's right, and and we have our, uh, we're not telling anyone who this is, but we have a journalist named uh, Dear Dot. <laughs> uh, you can uh, write her a question and she will answer it. And yeah. of course there'll be a website, uh, a big hub website, but also for the local uh, audiences. So so uh, it's, we're having a fabulous time, I have to tell you. <laughs> we're, we're inventing stuff as we go along. We have someone who's doing a, um, a column on electric cars, which sounds kind of boring. The good thing- No, about no, 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 we just had a local uh, dis- display of electric cars here. Well, so. there you are. So yeah. he's, the thing about him that's I think particularly good is that he's a terrible driver. <laughs> so he he's, other people who have electric cars will drive and he'll interview them. <laughs> so we're able to profile some really fun people in their Teslas or their Nissan Leaf or whatever uh-huh. and and drive around the neighborhood and stop at you know places for a sandwich or whatever. So so the spirit of it is easy and friendly. Oh, I love that. Now, I, I know you've come across a couple. I, w- I would love to just be able to share a tip or two with our viewers, something kind of easy or simple or fun that they might be able to begin incorporating right now. I think you said Vitamix has an interesting. Oh, I am so in love. I, I could be a spokesperson for this little <laughs> machine. <clears throat> it's about, it's well, you can't tell, uh, but, but it's like a foot by foot. It can sit on your countertop. Mm-hmm. And uh, the biggest issue, one of the big issues in climate change is the methane gas that causes the carbon dioxide in the air. And the methane comes from the decomposition of food. And we throw away enormous amounts of food every year. Well, why do we throw it? We shouldn't throw it away. Not everybody is a composter in their in their garden. It, you know that you can do that, and that's wonderful if you do it. But I have a little machine made by Vitamix. I put any uh, wasted food, uh, leftovers from chopping something, or people didn't finish their meal, which it does never happen in my house. Everybody eats <laughs> what I cook. I throw it into the Vitamix, and a few hours later, it's all it's beautiful compost. Wow. And I use it for my garden and I use it for potting. I put a little potting soil with it. It dries out the food and it comes out like be- this beautiful compost. <clears throat> well, so I'm sort of in love with the mag. I still love my husband. 
<laughs> but this machine is really in second place on in the love front. <laughs> so uh, you can get, and Vitamix is a wonderful company. They make uh -huh. all those great uh, food processing things and uh, for uh, health drinks. They've been around for uh, since yeah, the late 40s. Yeah. So it's a really great company. So I, I but they're not paying me to say this, so that's even better. <laughs> Right. No, no, no funds have changed hands here. Well, it's interesting because I also I know a couple who is working on doing that sort of on an industrial level with something they right. call biochar. Uh, and I think using the the waste products in this positive way um, is just a tremendous Marshall Mermel is the uh, the name of the guy who's doing that. And it is really a tremendous uh, a gift when people can envision transforming these things that we look at as problems into something that can help us can help us really flourish. that's exactly right Irene and there's so much um, I mean this is why I'm having such a good time because I'm finding and learning about uh, hundreds of good companies or good ideas mm -hmm. we the consumer or the people who live in towns where we live we need to f participate by finding those good companies, that's what I hope to help people do. Mm -hmm. And by supporting those uh, enterprises, but because it's a, it's a whole, it's a circle. We have to close the circle mm -hmm. between us, the regular folks, the entrepreneurs who have uh, ingenuity and uh, are coming up with great products. And, and then we don't have to consume as much we could just like let's tune it down a little bit and go for a walk yeah 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 oh, oh i love that and you, you mentioned some good uh i'm, I'm just going to give you this opportunity too some good <laughs> cotton companies uh well places like that we that. might look i i find these companies that i think look at how much care and thought so they regular cotton is probably the worst thing you can buy you know, so there are companies that uh, just sell organic cotton, for example. But there's a wonderful company I found called Amour, like in love, Vert, as in oh, green. Oh, I love them. Yes. Yeah, yes, you know yes. them. They make great clothes, mm -hmm. and they come packaged perfectly in cardboard, no plastic, and then clothes that you don't want. They give you a gift certificate to send to Threads Up to this other company. So it's like a complete circle. Right. So everything they do has been carefully thought through. And where there is plastic, it's compostable. Oh. So, you know, the town you town I live in needs to do a better job with that filmy plastic. Uh -huh. But that filmy plastic stuff, all that yeah. plastic stuff can be made into something else. There's a great company called Trex. You've probably heard of Trex. Sure. They do decking and they yeah. do. Up above, we have a <clears throat> we have a rooftop deck made of that. There you go. Well, yeah. that's all plastic that's been recycled. Uh, so Trex is happy to have it, but someone has to collect it and get it to them. That's just one big step. Mm -hmm. But once the system is in place, then it just keeps going and you don't have to think about it anymore. Wow. So now, yeah. I'm just I'm I'm thinking oh, well, there may be somebody watching who might want to know more about Blue Dot and how mm -hmm. either they might be able to start one in their own uh, neck of the woods uh, using the template that you guys have come up with, uh, or they might just want to look at a copy when it when it's out on the newsstands or the whatever stands. Um, it, it, do you have like a web address that people could check in? We don't quite have that all up yet. It's all uh -huh. live in about three weeks. Oh, great. So if they are in touch with you, Irene, maybe you can you can send them on to me. I surely <laughs> will. I surely but, will. Uh, yeah, Remember, we, what's the name of the magazine? <laughs> Blue Dot Living uh, at Home you want, oh, on Earth. Do tell us, uh, many of us probably know where that uh, name comes from, but maybe some of us don't. Well, that's true. Probably most of you know that it, it comes from a quote from the wonderful astrophysicist, Carl Sagan, who said, if you are imagining Earth from outer space, it's like a pale blue dot. And that's where everyone you know lives and where everyone you love is. 
and you know to take we need to take care of that little speck of dust in the universe mm -hmm. it's a beautiful quote so we took that and we attached the word living because we all want to live well mm -hmm. in a healthy way and and a, with quality things around us taking lovely walks at the same time and at home on earth because this is our home on earth so we packaged that whole concept together it's kind of our charge to take care of that pale mm. blue dot mm. ah, love it love it love it i can't <laughs> believe our time has flown as quickly as it has uh, I, I need to ask you the question i ask of all my guests even though you've given me some pretty good ideas uh, what makes you glad to be human Oh, I wake up every morning with excitement. And I think it's because, uh, first of all, human beings are extraordinary, right? So just the best of people, just to interact with the best of people in my world, but also to feel that I can be part of any endeavor where I'm making um, the world a slightly better place is, is so much better than um, not. <laughs> than, <laughs> than sitting around and feeling gloom and doom. I just, re I've oh, always yeah, resisted so. that. I'm an mm -hmm. optimist, optimist, optimist by mm -hmm. by nature. Mm -hmm. I always uh, find the silver lining or the pony and the pile of whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I am with you, and I have to say, those of us inhabiting this blue dot are very much in your debt for the ways that you continue, that you have and continue to improve it for all of us. Uh, Vicki Riskin, get her book, look at Thank Blue you. Dot Living. Thank you to everybody, anybody. And I just offer my deep gratitude mm -hmm. and a little song to take us out. Thank you one and all for watching, whether it's live or archived. We're very grateful you chose to watch. Glad to be human. Very grateful for my <laughs> guest, care. Vicki Riskin. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye.